picking up where we left off. I'm going to try, fingers crossed, knock on wood, prayers, crystals, whatever. Um, I'm going to try and do about 1,000, 1,300 lines tonight. We'll see, since we're only up to 760-something after, what, four days? Um, we left off, I believe, around 767. So <clears throat> Grindel is attacked. Beowulf, he's eaten Honchu. Beowulf's grabbed his hand. And the next 20 lines or so are all about the battle inside Herat, where Beowulf and Grindel are in, in an arm wrestling, but not like this kind of arm wrestling, hand gripping thing, throwing each other up against the wall, but never letting go. Grindel wants to let go. Beowulf's not letting him. Beowulf's men get involved. They try and hit Grindel with their swords. They don't do any good. Um, and that's line 778 and following and such. So fit 12, we pick up in 794 and following, find out Beowulf's men draw their blades. Um, but we're told 801, no sword, not the best iron anywhere in the world, could even touch that evil sinner, for he had worked a curse on weapons, every sort of blade. So Grindel is magically protected. This is the only quote-unquote magic that's in the poem. There's no other instance, no other suggestion of magic. Um, if, if you want to call a spell on against weapons as magic, okay? So, they go on, and we're told at the bottom of page 95, line 810, 809, he discovered who had done before so much harm to the race of mankind, so many crimes, he was marked by God, kind of like whom? His great, 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 yeah, exactly, ancestor. Um, the Old English there for mark is this word, which means adorned, ornamented, um, trimmed, like when you trim out a Christmas tree and the Thanksgiving trimmings and stuff, you know, the adornments around the table. I guess marked works. Anyways. Beowulf holds on, and Grindel finally escapes by separating his arm from his body. And we get this description. 816. A gaping wound opened in his shoulder joint. His sinew sprang apart. His joints burst asunder. Beowulf was given, notice, Beowulf was given glory in battle. Passive tense. It's not Beowulf achieved. What did Beowulf say at the beginning of the battle, before he even started? Who? He's the will of God. God will determine the victor. Okay? So, Grendel was forced to flee, etc., etc. He knew quite surely the end of his life had arrived, the sum of his days, etc. He who had come, 825, he who had come from afar, he cleansed wise and stout heart of the hall of Hrothgar, warded off attack. Now, he who had come from afar, does that echo anything that's happened earlier in the poem? Much earlier? Uh, shield shoving. Shield shoving. Okay. He came from afar also. He didn't purge, cleanse Herat, because there wasn't any Herat at that point, but he did come as a consolation for the people who who take their names, take their name from him. Okay? The shieldings. So we're told the man of the gates had fulfilled his boast, et cetera, et cetera. He'd remedied all their distress. That is, he was a frovra, he was a consolation, he was a comfort. The insidious sorrows they had suffered and had, this is line 830 and following, they had to endure from sad necessity. That was a clear sign. What was the clear sign that Beowulf was victorious? He takes Grindel's arm and he hangs it from the ceiling. What would be a better token? 
a better sign. Okay. Yeah, because you know, you know, unless we're talking Sir Gowan and the Green Knight, you know, people don't walk around without their heads. They can walk around briefly without an arm, because think Monty Python and the Holy Grail and the Black Knight. Mm -hmm. So, morning comes, and we're told many a warrior, the leaders of the folk, do what? They come into Herat and they look around. What do they not see? A bunch of dead geats, or pieces of a bunch of dead geats. They see Beowulf, they see Beowulf's men. They see the hand, the arm, with the claw, the hand, with claws, okay, that are described as being like nails, okay? We get a description of the path that Grindel took, and they know what the path is because they can follow the gore. Because as he's walking, you know. And they go to the pool, 845, where there's a pool of sea monsters, doomed, put to flight, left a fatal trail. The water was welling with blood there. So think of a natural spring, and it's bubbling up in the middle, and there's just this blood, okay? Pretty gruesome. It concealed that doomed one when, deprived of joys, he lay down his life in his lair in the fen, his heathen soul and hell took him. That's the poet Shope speaking. It's not Beowulf. Beowulf's gonna later on, the character is gonna later on say, who knows where his soul went? He's, he's much more generous. Okay? So, why did we get that scene? They're following the track. Why? They want to find the rest of the body that goes with the arm to make sure he's dead. The track leads straight to the pool of water with the sea monsters in it in, you know, a fountain of blood. So, they're assuming it's pretty clear that he's dead. So as they make their way back, what do they do? Some of them race their horses, and one of them starts composing a song. And we're told, 856, there they celebrated Beowulf's glory. It was often said that south or north, between the two seas, across the wide sea, there was none better under the billowing broad billowing sky among shield warriors, none more worthy to rule, or nor more worthy to rule, though they found no fault with their own friendly king, gracious Hrothgar, but said he was a good king. It's an A. Ach, that was good kidding. We first heard just this about Shield. That was a good king, you know, after he deprives other people of their meat benches, after he expands his kingdom, after he forces them to pay tribute. Now we hear this, but that was a good king applied to Hrothgar. Why the but? What have we just been told about Beowulf? Bingo, that among shield warriors, there is none more worthy to rule. No one, meaning no one more worthy to be king than Baal. Oh, no, no. but Hrothgar's a good king too. What kind of praise is that? Yeah, yeah. Okay, then they keep writing and we're told, 867. At times, the king's thing, full of grand stories, full of grand stories. That is, this guy remembers all the tales, all right? Mindful of songs, who remembered much, a great many of the old tales, found other words truly bound together. Yeah, that is what the Old English means, but the Old English is more active. He bound other words together in his mind. That is, he's got all of these tales up here, right? And it's like, 
he picks portions. Okay? This is probably alluding to um, what's called oral formulaic composition. And we, and we don't have time, we won't go into a lot of this. I think your introduction slightly touches on it. This is the theory <coughs> behind how poets in pre-literate societies created poems. Homer, for example. You read anything by Homer and you'll see phrases repeat again and again and again. Athena of the gray eyes, the wine dark seas, etc. Those are formulas. And what a poet does is the poet has this stock, like a warehouse up here, of formulas that get plugged into various places. In Old English poetry, plugged into where, why? Because of the alliterative pattern. And because they need a certain number, number of syllables. So you get these stock phrases and then other parts or additional information get composed on the fly. Which is why it's thought, probably most poetry, take that back, all poetry, before it was written down, each time it is sung, it's different. That is, there are twists. You could, I don't suggest doing this, you could get on my, as an example of how this kind of works, you, in a very poor, poor, poor analogy, you can get on my YouTube channel, you can watch every lecture I've done on Beowulf. None of them are, are the same. Why? I don't work from nuts. I mean, I've got pieces underlined in the book, but you know, Beowulf and Tolkien and Rowling stuff I know so well, I just, that's what those poets did. And we know this because scholars in the 1930s went to what was then Yugoslavia, and they recorded bards, B-A-R-D-S, who were telling, singing songs that would take three, four, five hours to sing. These are several thousand lines long, like the Odyssey. They had it all up here, and they could record one version of it, one performance, and then two days later, three days later, you could hear another bard. It'd be similar. You'd have the same main characters, but little details would be different. Okay? That's probably what's going on here. And what do they, what does this old retainer do? So, he found other words truly bound together. He began again to recite with skill the adventure of Beowulf, adeptly tell an apt tale, and weave his words. And he does what? And this is our only allusion in the poem to this individual. He connects Beowulf with Sigamund and Fitula. Sigamund, famous, Germanic, dragon slayer. In other versions called Sigurd, sometimes Siegfried, okay? And he tells us a story about how Sigamund slew a dragon. This is one of the most famous stories in Germanic literature. Okay? It's also one of the only dragon stories in Western literature. You've got this one, you've got another one in Old Norse, who's titled um, Faf, Faf Thrusnes Small, about the death of Fafnir. You've got this one, you've got Beowulf, and that's pretty much it. Except for some Celtic stuff, and there's not much. Most of the really, really Powerful dragon literature, it's Chinese. Chinese dragon, dragon's different than, you know, Western dragon and such. So, he tells the story of Sigamund and the Volsung Stripe. This is the early, by the way, this is the earliest reference to this character in Germanic literature. Okay? Earliest surviving reference. Whether the poem dates from 1000 AD or 700 AD, it's still the earliest and talks about him and his nephew Fitula, and you've got a footnote, long footnote down there, okay? <clears throat> How he talked about a dragon, he killed a dragon, a keeper of a horde, line 887. Um, Fitula, his nephew, wasn't by his side, yet so it befell him that his sword pierced the one whose serpent stood fixed in the wall of the manly iron, the dragon met his death, 
Okay? Only reason I'm emphasizing that line. What are we told happened to Sigamund's sword when he kills the dragon? It gets stuck in the wall. Okay? In the, in the Norse version of this event, Sigurd is told by a dwarf how to kill the dragon. And if he kills the dragon and drinks the dragon's blood, he'll learn the language of birds. Okay? So what he does is he, climbs, he crawls down into a trench that the dragon's about to crawl over. And when the dragon comes over the trench, he stabs up, kills the dragon, is drenched in the blood, drinks some of it, learns the language of the birds. The birds tell him, don't trust the dwarf. He's going to kill you, blah, blah, blah. Okay? This, in that version, the sword doesn't get stuck in a wall. Okay? There's a reason this is going to be important. It has something to do with Grendel's fight with Beowulf's fight with Grendel's mother. All right? So, the serpent melts in its own heat. Why? Because dragons are fire breathers. And then we're told, 898, he was the most famous of exiles far and wide among all people, protector of warriors, for his noble deeds. He had prospered for them. He who? Sigmund, possibly, or Beowulf, possibly. Because the whole Sigmund um, digression you have in Beowulf things that are called episodes and digressions. Okay? Famous part of the critical commentary on Beowulf. Episodes and digressions. Digressions are small little rabbit trails that have an end. A very, usually a very quick end. Okay? Episodes are where you get like a whole scene of something. Like, you know, what do we call in multi TV series. What episode? Okay? Episode comes from the term comes from Greek drama. Um, I won't go into it. Okay? So you have episodes and digressions. We get here, okay, a little digression about Haramon. Alright? So he was the most famous of exiles, far and wide, among all people, protector of warriors. For his noble deeds, he had prospered for them since the struggles of Haramod had seized his might and valor. Now, even though I said that, that he could be Beowulf, I don't think it is. It's pretty clear it's talking about Sigmund. Okay? Since the struggles of Haramod had ceased. Do we know who Haramod is at this point? We, 21st century, no, we have no idea. Okay? When Beowulf was first transcribed and everything, first brought to a kind of a modern audience, early 19th century, that audience didn't know who Haramod was until research was done, et cetera, et cetera. Look at the number of names that are in this poem. They're just scattered. And it is assumed that an Anglo-Saxon audience hearing this poem performed, recited, they were aware of who these people were. For example, I could say Benedict Arnold. And almost all of you know, have some reference to Benedict Arnold. An Anglo-Saxon audience wouldn't. Okay, A colonial American audience wouldn't. Probably the vast majority of people in Europe would have no idea. Okay, But it's part of our kind of cultural history. Most of these people are probably part of their cultural history. They knew or had heard or were familiar with stories of some of these people. Okay? Haramod is one of these. He's a biggie. Why? Well, just now you have Thakmas Godkinning, you have an, a picture of an ideal or good king throughout Beowulf. We're going to get a picture or an ideal of a bad king. That's Haramod. Haramod is the quintessential bad king. For the simple reason, he doesn't follow the Germanic ethic. He doesn't reciprocate for his warriors. So, among the Jutes, you got a footnote there, perhaps Aeton, which could be giants, okay? 
He was betrayed into his enemy's hands. So if he was betrayed, who did the betraying? Only who can do a betrayal? His people, right? Joe Biden, for example, he's over there in Europe right now. He couldn't be betrayed by Zelensky. You know, he walked around in Kiev the other day. He couldn't capture Zelensky, couldn't capture Biden and <laughs> deliver him to Putin, so to speak. That wouldn't be a betrayal, right? If the Secretary of State handed him over, that would be a betrayal. Or the Vice President or, you know, whoever else part of his administration. So it's Haramod's people that betray him into the hand of the Jews. Now you would think, wait, duty to one's Lord. That's top of the epic. Hmm. The surgeon of cares had crippled him too long. Well, who else in the poem have we heard about with the surging of cares? Hrothgar. But Hrothgar doesn't do what Haramod did. The surging of cares had crippled him too long. He became a deadly burden to his own people, okay? To all noblemen. For many a wise man had mourned in earlier times over his headstrong ways, who had looked to him for relief from affliction. Now, up to this point, it still sounds like he and Hrothgar sound pretty similar, right? 12 years, Hrothgar's men looked to him for relief from affliction. They didn't get it, okay? Hope that that prince's son would prosper. Not named, we don't know who that is. Receive his father's rank, rule his people, hoard and fortress, a kingdom of heroes, the shielding homeland. Uh, the kinsman of Helak became to all the race of mankind a more pleasant friend. Kinsman of Helak, who is that? Beowulf. Helak is Beowulf's uncle. Right? So, we get Sigmund and Fitula, uncle and nephew. We get Haramode, and, and Sigmund is held up as, as an ideal. He's a dragon killer. Okay? Then we get the Haramode episode, and all we're told is that he was betrayed by his people. Why? Because he didn't alleviate their affliction. And then the poet brings us back to Beowulf. Okay? The kinsman of Helak became to notice all the race of mankind a more pleasant friend. Not to just the shieldings. Semicolon, sin possessed him. And notice you have a footnote. Why? Because the footnote Leuza is making clear the him is not Beowulf. It's the one before Beowulf, Haramode, all right? Sometimes competing, so the guys keep writing back. And they get back to Herod at the same time as what happens. Top right-hand column. They went to see the high hall to see the strange wonder. The king himself, guard of the treasure hoard, strode glorious from the woman's chambers with a great entourage, a chosen retinue, and his royal queen with him measured the mead hall path with a troop of maidens. The great entourage, the chosen retinue, a lot of critics went to assert that that refers to like his house carls, his personal things, his secret service protection. The poem doesn't suggest that. The great retinue can be the queen's troop of maidens. Problem with this image? I think there is. There's a few other Beowulf scholars who kind of think there could be. Because what does it suggest? Okay, Beowulf has spent the evening doing what? One evening. Not 12 years. One evening. Defeating Grendel. His men have come back from Grendel's mirror, singing Beowulf's, Beowulf's praises to the highest heavens, comparing him with Sigmund. Okay, 
which is also foreshadowing for something that's going to come later. Meanwhile, Hrothgar's coming out of his wife's bedroom, surrounded by her retinue, ladies in waiting. Um, not very heroic, not very manly. Well, I guess in one sense you could say very manly, but not in an Anglo-Saxon Germanic heroic sense. Fit 14, Hrothgar speaks. He goes to the hall, he stands on the steps, beheld the steep roof, now notice what we're told, which we weren't told before. We were just told the hall was gold colored, plated with gold. Hrothgar's loaded. It's tribute <laughs> that he demanded from others. He sees Grindel's hand and says, for this sight let us swiftly offer thanks to the Almighty. Much have I endured of dire grief from Grindel. But God may always work. Notice, may. Does it say God always works? God may always work. Shepherd of glory. Notice that, that, that shepherd, it's that same here did that I wrote down the other day. And it can be translated king, king of glory. And you go back to, you know, Isaiah kind of language. But shepherd kind of like, come here, glory, come here, come here. Like herding glory around. Wonder upon wonder. Okay, so God can, God can do all kinds of things. It was not long ago that I did not expect ever in my life to experience relief from any of my woes. How long ago was it? Yesterday morning. It was yesterday morning that Beowulf arrived. That morning when Hrothgar got up, he thought that morning, like he did every morning for the last 12 years, Grendel's going to come ravage again. Okay? Nine thirty. Uh, let's just keep going. I did not expect to ever in my life to experience relief from any of my foes. That is, he didn't expect to see any change. Go back to one seventy-five to one eighty-eight. Thrust in the embrace of fire, etc., etc. Any of my woes, when stained with blood, this best of houses stood dripping gory, a widespread woe to all wise men who did not expect that they might ever defend the people's fortress from its foes. Okay, the wise men that he's talking about, his counselors that earlier was, we were told did what? The first night after Grendel came apparently. They started praying to the slayer of souls. Now a retainer has done the very deed, meaning a thane. Okay? Through the might of God. God enabled him to do this. God gave him the strength to do this. What did Hrothgar, when Hrothgar first comments about Beowulf's arrival, when Wolfgar comes and tells him, what does Hrothgar say about Beowulf's strength? He tells us two things about it. One, he has the strength of 30 men in his hand grip. And two, where did he get the strength from? God. Hrothgar says that. That almighty God has given him this strength. Okay? Through the might of God, which we all could not contrive to do with all our cleverness. Now he's suggesting there, we thought of it. We tried to come up with ways, but they were unable to. Okay? Lo, that woman could say, Whoever has borne such a man into the race of men, if she still lives. Why does he say whoever? What, what woman is he talking about, first of all? Beowulf's mother. Which in that first speech that Hrothgar makes about Beowulf, he tells us, the, uh, the readers, or the audience, who's Beowulf's mother. No. Daughter of Hrethel the Geat. 
he gave, Hrethel gave his daughter to Ejthiel in marriage. So he knows who she is. We don't know her name. The manuscript never names her. So that woman could say, whoever is born such a son into the race of men, if she still lives, that the God of old was good to her in childbearing. That is like a mini version. I, I see it as a biblical illusion. I could be wrong. Some other scholars do. I don't think he, he doesn't give us a footnote. A encapsulation, if you want, a summary of Mary's Magnificat. You know, Mary goes and visits Elizabeth. When Elizabeth's pregnant, Mary's pregnant. And, and Elizabeth says, you know, who am I to welcome the mother of my Savior, essentially? And then Mary goes on and gives her this big, long speech about how blessed she is and how she will be blessed of all generations of women and such. Now I will cherish you, Beowulf, best of men, like a son in my heart. Hold well henceforth your new kinship. You shall have no lack of any worldly goods which I can bestow. Remember, what did he tell Beowulf before he handed him the keys to the hall? If you win wealth, you'll be rich. Okay? What does Hrothgar mean when he says, now I will cherish you like a son in my heart? Is this a formal legal proceeding? No. It's just, man, Beowulf, you'll always be here. Okay, so he says, hold well from now forward your new kinship. He's saying there is now a tie between us. Is he, because of what's going to come up briefly, is he adopting Beowulf? See, a lot of scholars and critics read that as, you know, clearly Hrothgar is adopting him because of what wealthy I was going to say in a few minutes. Is Wealthiel here at this moment? Yes, she is. She hears what Hrothgar says. Okay? So he says, Now by yourself you've done such deeds that your fame will endure always and forever. May the Almighty reward you with good as he has already done. So Beowulf speaks. Freely and gladly have we fought this fight. We, first of all, Notice what Beowulf's doing. Is this the royal we? No. He's giving credit to his men. It wasn't me by myself. It was him by himself. This is just Beowulf showing he's not a narcissist. Okay? What else? Look at the first word. What word is that? 958. Real quickly. Yeah, it is freely. Why does he say freely and gladly have we fought this fight? Okay. Good possibility. Because he felt when he showed up there, he said that you were here because you owed a debt. Bingo. He's saying, no debt here. I did this, I did this entirely out of my own free will. I didn't do this because I owed you something. All right. Have we done this deed of courage, daringly faced Grindel, blah, 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 blah. Okay. So he talks about how he fought with Grindel. He says, I wanted to creep, I wanted to keep Grindel here, but 967, the creator did not wish it. Notice, I can't contend with God. I wanted Grindel to be dead here. God wouldn't allow that. I couldn't hinder his going, no matter how hard I held that enemy's, that deadly enemy. He forfeited his hand, blah, 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 blah. He goes on, and the end of that speech, 977. And there he shall abide, guilty of his crimes, the greater judgment. What's the greater judgment? This is probably another biblical illusion. This is not the first death. This is the second death, the final judgment. How the shining maker wishes to sentence him. Notice what Beowulf doesn't do. He doesn't condemn the first one. He 
doesn't condemn them. It's up to God. It's not my job. Above my pay grade, you know. Then the son of Edgelaf was more silent. Who's the son of Edgelaf? Mm -hmm. Unferth. Notice, by the way, Edgelaf, Unferth, they both begin with vowels. Um, Got to get the names right. Hafdane, Haragar, Hrothgar, Holiga, unknown sister, Hrethel, Harabald, Hathkin, Hialak, unknown sister. When we get to the Swedes, we're going to have Onyanthal, Othra, Onula, all begin with vowels. All the names in the dynastic lines, they alliterate. This is Germanic custom. Okay? One name doesn't alliterate. Edgethal, Beowulf. Big, big problem. His name should alliterate. It's another way of the poet doing what? Setting him apart, kind of saying, he's not from around these parts. He's a little different than the rest of us. Okay? It's, it's showing Beowulf's capital O, otherness. All right? So, Unferth shuts up, okay? And go to fit 15. So they adorn Herat, and let's see here. Hrothgar goes to the hall, they have a feast, and we're told, 10-11. I've never heard of a greater host who bore themselves better before their treasury giver. Those men in their glory moved to their benches, rejoiced in the feast. Fairly, those kinsmen took many a full mead cup, stout-hearted in the hall. Hrothgar and Hrothulf. It's the first time Hrothulf has been introduced. Okay. Hrothulf is Hrothgar's nephew. He's probably been sent to live with Hrothgar to be raised as a foster son. Not like you know, modern American foster children kind of a thing. But Hrothel's father or mother has sent him to live with his uncle so that Hrothgar, sorry, i got to get the names right, could teach him how to be a king. How to be a warrior. Okay? And you got a footnote down at the bottom. Hrothgar and Hrothel, forever out within, was filled with friends. No false treacheries did the people of the Shieldings plot at that time. It's possible to infer that after the death of Hrothgar, his nephew Hrothel ruled rather than Hrethric, Hrothgar's son. That is, Hrethric, Hrothgar's eldest son. He has two sons, Hrethric and Hrothmund. Hrothgar, Hreth, Hreth. There's your alliteration again. Many scholars assume that the story of some sort of treacherous usurpation was known to the audience. This gives a special urgency to much of what happens in these scenes. Okay? What's that, what that's talking about <coughs> is in Norse stories, Old Norse stories of the Skjöldung dynasty. That's the Shielding in Old English. It's Skjöldung in Old Norse dynasty. There are stories of Hrothulf usurping the throne of Hrothgar. That is, Hrothgar dies, and then Hrothulf takes the throne. Okay? So you get that. There is friendship, etc. No false treacheries did the people of the Shieldings plot at that time. Well, if there were false treacheries, would that, in one sense, be fitting? After all, who sits at the center of the hall at Hrothgar's feet? Unferth, a kinslayer. That's a pretty false treachery. He gave to Beowulf the sword of Halfdane, the blade of Halfdane. That is, he gives Beowulf 
kind of like the great ancestor's heirloom weapon. He gives them a whole bunch of stuff, okay? And we get descriptions of all the arms and armor and such, which we're going to skip. Um, go down to fit 16. I mean, that, again, that's the kind of stuff prior to, well, and even after Tolkien, a lot of scholars, I mean, that's the stuff they just ate up to figure out everything we could about Germanic material culture, okay? So fit 16. Then we're told, um, Hrothgar gives treasure to Beowulf's men, and he gives Ware Guild to be taken back to pay the family of the man who is slain. Is it Hrothgar's responsibility? It was his house. She and go back a few thousand years before Germanic in Indo-European custom. And we know this from looking at the literature and mythology of all the different nationalities that come from Indo-European. That rule of hospitality says, if someone enters in, if someone comes to your door, whether the person is friend or foe, you are bound by this unwritten law of hospitality to give them shelter for the evening. And if something happens to them while they're in your home, that's on you. So even if your enemy comes during a driving rainstorm, you have to give your enemy shelter. While there, the enemy cannot violate that shelter. That is, there are bonds, so to speak, on that person too. But if that enemy has an enemy attack, you have to protect your enemy who's in your house that night. Okay? So, yeah, in that sense, Hrothgar does owe the wear guilt, okay? And we're told there, he then ordered that gold be paid, 1054, from the man whom Grindel had wickedly slain, he would have done more, that is Grindel, if wise God and one man's courage had not prevented, prevented that thing. You remember the word I'd written down over here last week? We were talking about the Boethian kind of, kind of context, and I had synergy. And synergy is what? Within the world of the poem. God's will and human wills working together. Notice what was said there. If wise God, in one man's courage, had not prevented that fate, The poet relating the overall story is essentially saying if Beowulf had never decided to come, what? Grindel would still be ravaging. Why? Because God needs an agent. It doesn't mean God can't, you know, miraculously reach down himself and Grindel. Okay? <laughs> Similarly, if Beowulf had come on his own and God hadn't willed it, Beowulf probably would have lost. Okay? So, the maker ruled all of the race of mankind as he still does. That's a little bit different from that passage we saw the other day. Line 700 and following. It is a well-known truth that almighty, excuse me, that mighty God has ruled mankind always and forever. Because the always and forever kind of implies present tense right now, right? Compare that with as he still does. What's the poet saying? The maker ruled all the race of mankind. When? Hot in Yeardogun, back then in days of yore. And then what does the poet do? Exactly. He takes that and brings it right up to now. And God is still in control. God still rules. So, when I was a graduate student studying this, I raised the question, because I was reading this in context with some other things. 
Who's the poet's audience? When is the poet speaking this? And I kind of came up with an idea. I could be wrong. I, not, not many people, well, nobody has come up with the same idea, which is why I was working on a book for a long time and was too lazy, never did it. Think of the poet. Think of the possibility. If the poet's audience is a group of Anglo-Saxons living in the, and I forget the name, forgot the name of the word again, the part of England ruled by the Danes. Not the Danemark, not the Dane Guild, Dane. The Dane law, in the Dane law, okay? Group of Anglo-Saxons ruled by an Anglo-Danish chieftain. The race of, God has ruled. God ruled the race of men back then. Why? Because the Anglo-Saxon audience is being told of stories that happened several hundred years ago. He was in control then. He stopped the ravages of Grindel, as he still does. What does the as he still does immediately possibly do? What is happening to us now is not chance. Anglo-Saxon audience under the subjugation of a foreign power. It could even be, if you take Kevin Kiernan's theory, and that Beowulf dates from the reign of Canute, Canute is Norwegian. He's not English. And he ruled for nearly 20 years. Right? God was con in control then. He's still in control now. Even when we are being pushed down. Possibly. All right? Therefore, understanding is always best. Notice the speaker of the poem. There's no other way to read, I don't think, this passage than to say the speaker is addressing the audience personally and directly. Therefore, understanding is always best. Spiritual foresight. It doesn't mean prophesying, you know, telling the future. It means seeing clearly. He must face much, right? Vikings have been coming for hundreds of years ravaging your people, your places, etc. He must face much, both love and hate, who long here endures this world in... See, and this, this idea, our modern 21st century Nambi Pambi mindset is, oh, well, life shouldn't be this way. Life should be fair. Life should be wonderful. Life should be pixie dust and fairies and unicorns. And in this, these days of strife. The poet is speaking to his audience and says, yeah, life's hard. And if you're going to keep living, you've got you to gotta do what? you got to endure <laughs> much. It's not all bad, right? Look at what he says. Love and hate. I don't think that means from the same person. <laughs> Probably familial love, but hate from out there. And it's noise and stuff mingles. It's like off the soapbox, out of the pulpit, now back to, meanwhile, back in Herat, we get back to the story. And what happens? A shope in the hall, a poet in the hall, possibly the same one who created the, the song about Beowulf, Okay, thinking of Sigmund and talking about Beowulf, gives us, I don't remember how he spells it, G or, does he spell the word anywhere? Well, I'll put the G on it. He gives us the Finsburg episode, okay? A story somewhat similar to this, having the same characters, exists in another form. That is, we have what's called the Finsburg Fragment. 
portion of a manuscript, okay? Probably, again, it's, it's fragmentary, probably it's assumed that poem was at least 600 lines long and possibly as long as Beowulf, okay? So the poet is taking, let me rephrase that. The poet may be taking another story and just kind of dropping it in here, like the way Tolkien does with Tom Bombadil. Tom Bombadil does not belong in The Lord of the Rings. Tom Bombadil had his own story, The Adventures of Tom Bombadil, which was published in 1947, 48, something like that. And then Tolkien's writing The Lord of the Rings, and he just drops Tom Bombadil hook, line, and sinker right in the middle of the story, which is why every version, film version, completely excises him. He doesn't belong, okay? This does. This is at the heart of this poem. So, we're introduced to Hildebert, one of the few named women characters in the poem. We have Hildebert, we, had, we already heard Welthau. We have Hildebert, in a few moments we'll be introduced to Modthriv, another woman, and then we're gonna have Hug, Helite's wife, okay? And we get a big, long, story about her and her family, all right? So we have Hawk, who has two children, Hamath and Hildebert. Hildebert marries Finn. Okay, so there are people of the Jutes, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, excuse me, they're childings, and we're going to skip a bit. Um, 1075, not without cause, did she mourn fate's decrees, the daughter of Hawk, after daybreak came, and she could see the slaughter of her kin. Why? Here's the story. Hildebert is married, married off to Finn, okay, who is the leader of the Frisians. These people are going to be important also later in the poem. Hnaf is her elder brother. And when she goes off and marries Finn, she's given a, a small retinue of men, okay, some Danes or shields, shieldings if you want. And one day it enters Hnaf's mind that he's going to go visit his sister, okay? So back up for a second. Why is she married off to Finn? Her marriage is referred to as a peace weaving. Her marriage to Finn is, to, is supposed to unite two royal families that are hostile to each other. And by families, that also means nations. The Shieldings and the Frisians do not get along. So, Marry a princess and marry a prince together and do what? Bring peace between these families. So that's what happens. Hnaf goes to visit and war breaks out in the hall. So we're going to skip a bit. Um, after day breaks, the slaughter of her kin under the very skies, 1080. War took away all the things of Finn except a few. That is, many of the Frisians, Finn's people, die in this battle, okay, so that he could not continue at all a fight with Hengist on the battlefield. Well, who the frick is Hengist? Hengist is Hnaf's right hand man, okay? One of the reasons this poem, this fragment, this episode, whatever you want to call it, historically was looked at very important, or historically was looked at with very eager eyes, is because Hengist is the name of one of the two Germanic warriors who were involved in the Germanic invasions of England, or excuse me, of Britain, that are referred to by Bede as beginning in 449, 450. Hengist and his brother, 
Horsa, both of whose names mean stallion, stud. <laughs> okay? These are warriors, all right? But Horsa is not mentioned in the Finnberg episode. Hengist is mentioned here. Why? Because Neff is killed in the battle. Finn lives. She and Finn have a son together who is old enough to fight. And the implication is they kill each other. Okay? That's why it's, you know, uh, the slaughter of her kin. So war took away all the things as then. Hengist is left on the battlefield. Finn can't fight Hengist, so they come to an agreement. Finn's men, the remainder, and Hengist and his men will winter in the same hall. Why? Because winter is now coming, the rivers have frozen over, and they can't sail away. So we're told half, would, half of the control would go to the Jutes, half would go to Folkwalder's son, that's Hengist, okay? And each day, the Frisians would kind of honor the Danes as kind of making nice to help the winter months to pass along. 1095. They swore their pledges then on either side, a firm compact of peace. Okay? Swin for, swore oaths to Hengist, vice versa, etc. And they swore that none should break their pact in word or deed, not through malice, nor through malice should ever make mention, etc., etc. Okay? Oath is made ready. And what happens? Well, they got to take care of the dead from the battle. So Knaf, Hildebrand's brother, and her son are burned together on the same funeral pyre. 1114, Hildebrand or commanded on Knaf's pyre that her own son be consigned to the flames, etc., etc. She sings a sad lament, the warrior ascended. How does the warrior ascend? Does he suddenly turn into a god? Nope, it's the smoke from his body ascending. Kind of interesting, nearly the same language is used at the end of the poem to describe Beowulf's <laughs> ascent, because Beowulf is burned, because he dies, right? Then we're told, um, Fit 17, Hengist starts to dream of spring. He wants spring to come because he wants the rivers to melt so he can go back home. But, same time, he thinks of the treachery. See, because when Hanaf and his men arrived, it wasn't Hanaf and his men who started the war. It was Finn's men. Remember everything I said about the Indo-European custom of hospitality? You don't attack them. So what happens? Hengist gets his revenge. He avenges his dead lord. How so? Well, at this place at least, Finn's burg, burg there means fortress, encampment, defended place. At this place at least, the Frisians are wiped out. Hengist and his surviving men kill them all. And we know they kill them all because Hildebrand goes back to the land of the Danes, Shildings, with them. There's no one left for her. Right? That's 1157. On their sea journey, they bore that noble queen back to the Danes and led her to the people. The lay was sung, the entertainer song. Okay, so somebody describe that song for me. Why the why the Disgusted look on your face. It's tragic. it's tragic, right? What's at the heart of it? Feud. And that's what the poet decides to sing after Beowulf 
gets his great victory. Seeming to imply mm, we're not done with the feud yet. <laughs> well, Theo comes forth. We've already seen her once, right? She brings the cup. Now she comes forth again. 1162. In her golden crown to where the good two sat, nephew and uncle, their peace was still whole then, each true to the other. Kind of like the oaths sworn by Hengist and Finn. Notice, their peace was still whole then. That, that then tells you everything. It's not going to be for long. Likewise, the poet says, Unferth, spokesman, Thule, okay, down at your footnote, sat at the foot of the shielding Lord. Everyone trusted in his spirit. What's the poet doing? And again, most scholars do not like to read it the way I'm suggesting we should read it. Okay. Hrothgar and Hrothulf, their, their peace is still whole. And yet, what's down here? Unferth. Mar peace, unpeace, unfaith, mar faith, untruth. How can you have this peace when literally at the center of the kingdom is like a black hole, sucking the truth, the peace, the faith, all that kind of stuff away from it? in the person of a kin slayer. Everyone trusted his spirit that he had great courage. Though to his kinsmen, he had not been merciful in swordplay. Notice, that is not Beowulf saying that. That is our poet. That is the shope. So Beowulf said, you're a kin slayer, and now the poet confirms that. Everyone trusted in his spirit, we're told. Thought he had great spirit, or that he had great courage. And then we get, though he had not been, though to his kinsmen he had not been merciful. Then wealth the outcomes for. Take this cup, my noble, courteous lord, giver of treasure, be truly joyful, gold for... She's speaking to Rothgar, right? And she says, Lord, have a drink. Be grateful, be joyful, speak to the geats as mild word, in mild words, as a man should do. Be gracious to the geats, etc., mindful of the gifts. Herod is cleansed. Let me back up, 1175. I have been told that you would take this warrior for your son. Well, she was there, it's implied, because she walked with Hrothgar from her bedchamber to Herod. But it's possible that when Hrothgar gave his speech about, you know, from here on out, you'll be like a son to me in my heart, he might have just been speaking just to Beowulf at that point. And nobody else heard that. Because now she says, I've been told you would take this warrior for your son. That's not what he literally said, though. So she says, Herod's cleaned. Use your many rewards while you can. That is, give him treasure. Give him all the treasure you want. And leave to your kinsmen the folk and kingdom. Who are the kinsmen she's talking about? Her sons, not Hrothulf. Okay? Why? Because what is a good king supposed to do? Leave something to his eldest son who will become king after him. And if that son dies, the next son will become king. When you must go forth to face the maker's decree. Okay. I know that my own dear, and then she addresses Rodolf. Well, let me rephrase that. She says these lines in Rodolf's hearing. She's still talking to Hrothgar. 
I know that my dear gracious Rava will hold and honors these youths, who are the, these youths, her sons. So when she says this, you know, it's like, here's the table, Hrothgar is here, Unferth is somewhere right nearby, maybe next to him. Hrothulf is probably over <clears throat> here, and then over here are Hrethric, Hrothmund, and right in between them, the big B. <laughs> Beowulf sitting between the sons. I know that my own dear gracious Hrothulf will hold and honors these youths if you should give up the world before him, friend of the shieldings. I expect he would wish to pay, repay both our sons kindly, if he recalls all the pleasures and honors we have shown him in our kindness since he was a child. Meaning what? What does she expect from Hrothulf? Not to take the throne because they basically raised him. That's exactly it. She expects him to treat his, what are these, cousins, I guess? I don't know. His relations with honor. Why? As repayment for how Hrothgar and Wealthyau treated him since he was a child. And then she, we're told, turns to the bench where her boy sat, Hrethric and Hrothman, and the son of heroes, all the, sin, all the youths together. The good man, Beowulf the Geat, sat between the two brothers. What is the purpose of this speech? Yes, I think at least. What else? Who else hears this? If we assume Hrothulf hears it, she turns to her son, so who else hears it? Beowulf. Beowulf and the two sons. Okay? Now they're boys. 10, 12, maybe 14. Not old enough to rule. Okay? And then she gives Beowulf treasure. Hrothgar gave him treasure. Now she's going to give him treasure. Fit 18. The greatest neck collar 1195 ever heard of anywhere on earth. And the poem goes on with a long description about it. It's called the Brazinga Necklace, etc. And you've got a footnote, possibly worn by the Norse goddess Freya, who's the knockout. You know, she's the Aphrodite of Norse goddesses. Okay? And Hama carried it off, etc. And we get the first time in the poem that Helix Frisian Raid is referenced. It's going to be referenced three times. So it's significant. It's important to the poet because the poet mentions it three times in the beginning, kind of in the middle, and later on towards the end. Okay? And so what is the poet doing here? Notice, he, like the gate on his last journey, had that neck ring. So the poet jumps forward in time. Not time forward to the poet's lifetime, but forward from when the events happen at Herod. Why? Because he, like, in this little short digression, 1202 to 12, 1214A, Helix is going to die in that Frisian raid. We have no reference to Beowulf being in that raid, but he is. Okay? So, fate struck him down, 1205, when in his pride he went looking for woe, a feud with the Frisian. Notice, he went looking for woe. He went looking for a feud with the Frisians. He opens a feud. Think of a feud as a wound. The only way you stop the feud, you close the wound. He opens a wound. That wound doesn't get closed for a long time. Okay? And he loses the neck ring on that journey. Giedish men held that killing field. Well, back up. Into Frankish hands, 1210, 
came the life of that king, meaning he got killed. His breast garments, the great collar too, a lesser warrior looted the corpses, mown down in battle. Gidish men held that killing field. And that's an ambiguous line. Because that can mean Gidish men were victorious or the Gidish men were in that killing field. They, they held it with their bodies dead. Because only one person, we're going to be told later, escapes from this, this battle. Beowulf. The Geats are victorious because Beowulf lives. And apparently, he kills all the Frisians. Apparently. So, Wealthyow then goes to Beowulf <coughs> and says, Wear this neck ring. In good health, enjoy this war garment, treasure of people, prosper well, be cold, be bold and clever, or cold and blever, whichever one. And to these boys, be mild in counsel. So she comes up to him and says this, and to these boys, so they hear it, and Rubble hears it, and Hrothner hears it, be mild in counsel. I will remember you for that. What does that mean to be mild in counsel? Does that mean, uh, get the right name, Rethric, come on, challenge, challenge Rock, uh, Rock, you can kill him. No, it doesn't mean that. It means be prudent in counsel. Okay? Counsel can mean verbal advice. It could also just mean kind of standing behind him and flexing his muscles, you know. Be a protector. You have made it so that men will praise you far and near, forever and ever, as wide as the seas, home of the winds, surround the shores of earth. I, okay, think, think of Rothgar back here. And she just said, Beowulf, people around the world are going to be singing your praises. I wish you well with these bright treasures. Be to my sons kind in your deeds. Meaning, be an ally to them. Be a friend to them in your deeds. What she really mean? Again, think of the physical context and think of how this whole passage began. Their peace was still holding, each true to the other, Hrothgar and Hrothulf. So then one should not be true to the other to decide which my sons? We don't have to worry about Hrothgar not being true to Hrothulf. It's the other way. So if Hrothulf does something, be faithful, be protector of my sons. What is she really doing? I mean, I, I think that part's true. Careful. It's not these two you'll have to fight. It's not Unfair's you have to fight. It's going to be the big guy in the middle, you know. Not many scholars read the poem that way. I think it's beyond clear. It's so freaking obvious. I, I don't, honestly, I don't see any other way to read that than her offering a very subtle warning. What other words would go deeper? Like, what do they say if they Um... Well, they, they, they don't take the earlier part as being elusive to Hrothulf challenging either Hrethric or Hrothgar. They just read it as, you know, it's, it's an allusion to something that's not clear within the world of the poem. But I don't think the world of the poem exists in um, isolation. I mean, poems don't exist, pretty, especially in these kinds of poems. They don't exist in isolation. They're part of, you know, the, everything you're talking about literature. It's part of a conversation. You know. The Germanic culture at large figures largely in this. I mean, when I would teach this graduate students, I'd have them read a book, H.R. Ellis Davidson, that's the author's name, The Gods and Myths of Northern Europe, so that they would be familiar with the mythology of the Germanic peoples. 
And then they read that, and then they read this, and their eyes go bing, 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 because they're open to all of these illusions. Okay? Be to my sons, kind in your deeds, keeping them in joys. Here each earl is true to the other, mild in his heart, loyal to his liege lord. The things united. See, in the scholars who don't read it the way I do, say, look, she's telling us. Nobody here has deceit in his heart to another. Or, what's another way of reading what she just said? Right now. Or irony. Or sarcasm. We all know Pravulf is going to be faithful to Hrothgar. And it's just dripping the sarcasm off of her. Okay? Again, the main... One of the reasons I read it that way is because of the other Old Norse material about the relationship between Hrothulf and Hrothgar. They don't get along. Okay, So, she goes to receipt, the best of feasts, the men drank wine, they did not know weird. Meaning, what will be, will be. The cruel fate which would come to pass for many an earl once evening came. Hrothgar goes to his own dwelling. Notice, who doesn't sleep in Herod that night? Beowulf. He sleeps in another room. Why? He's killed Grendel. Not a problem. The hall's cleansed. He gets to sleep in a nicer room. You know, He doesn't have to sleep on the floor. Fit 19, they sank into sleep. One paid sorely for his evening rest, as had often happened when Grendel guarded etc etc an avenger lived on after that enemy notice an avenger not marvel marvelous but not marvel who's she avenging grendel because what did beowulf do beowulf began a feud with grendel's mother by killing grendel why beowulf wasn't grendel's problem uh, grendel wasn't beowulf's problem grendel was rothgar's problem so she comes, okay, and we get a description about that. She comes, she takes another man, and the next morning, words brought to Hrothgar, 1306, 7. Then the wise old king, gray-bearded warrior, was grieved at heart when he learned that he no longer lived. The dearest of men, his chief name, was dead, a guy named Asherah. Beowulf comes in, and he's like, did you have a good night's sleep, Hrothgar? Man, I slept like a rock. Hrothgar, ask not of joys. Sorrow is renewed for the Danish people. Asherah is dead, etc. My confidant, my counselor, my shoulder companion. What does that mean? It's that age-old metaphor standing shoulder to shoulder in the battle. That is, the one you want standing on either shoulders Someone you can trust. Literally, with your life. Asherah was always there for him. Okay? And then he mentions what? I've heard countrymen and hall counselors among my people report this. 1345 and following. That they've seen two such creatures walking through the moors at night. Yeah. Really? What the hell, man? Why didn't you tell me you had two monsters? I I came to kill one. <laughs> it's like, we're going to up the pay now. And he describes Grendel's mirror. Gives us very detailed descriptions. It's got a cliff hanging over it with bare trees. There's hoarfrost all around. There's fire in the water. There are snakes. In English, vision of St. Paul. And also, I believe it's number 17. Two texts, two Anglo-Saxon texts, give us almost this exact same description. We 
which means the description is common to the three. And it could be that the Beowulf poet was familiar with one or both of these, or one or both of these were familiar with the Beowulf poet. Why is it significant? Because in these two texts, that description is of the entrance to hell. Where Grendel lives, in the vision of St. Paul, and in the Blickling homily number 17, that's what the entrance to hell looks like. Okay? Then the wise old king, 1306, gray-bearded warrior was grieved at heart when he learned that he, no, uh, sorry, wrong line. You do not yet know, 1378, this fearful place where you might find the sinful creature. Seek it if you dare. I mean, really. You just dared Beowulf. Like he's going to go, no, I'm, I'm afraid. I will reward, reward you with ancient riches, blah, blah, blah. And Beowulf says, sorrow not, wise one. Put that in modern English. Don't be sad. Suck it up. I mean, he's a warrior. Man up. It is always better to avenge one's friend than to mourn over much. And yet, what has Hrothgar personally done for the last 12 years? Mourn over much. Each of us must await the end of this world's life. I think I've made reference here before to Hamlet's line, the readiness is all, just before he fights Laertes in the fencing match. Let him who can bring about fame before death, that is best for the unliving man after he is gone. Notice what Beowulf, the character within the poem, is telling us. We all die. What should you do before you die? Get fame. Get glory. Get a reputation. Why? Because that's all there is once you die. Think Germanic mindset. That's, that's it. Okay. He says, I'll go fight her. And the old man leapt up, thank the Lord, the mighty God, for that man's speech. Okay. So, Beowulf and his men, and Hrothgar and his men, they march off to the mirror. And we're told, 1455, I'm skipping a part where they find Asherah's head, you know, because Grendel's mother's a sick little whatever. You know, they come around, the, come around the corner, and there's the head sticking on a cliff, just staring at them, like, <laughs> you know. And we're told, 1455 and following, what does Unferth do? Offers his sword to Beowulf. He gives his sword to Beowulf. What is this? What's he doing? What's he demonstrating? Possibly humility? Aid? Help? Notice how Beowulf replies. Gee, thanks, Roth uh, Unferd. Yeah, I'll take your sword. Okay. And he gives Unferd his sword. He reciprocates. Okay. What possibly could be the problem with Beowulf taking Uther's sword. Why is it his other sword? And, keep going, what might be in the sword? <laughs> the blood of his brother on the sword, metaphorically. This is the sword that was used to kill Kin. Who's Beowulf going to kill? The mama of Grendel. And because Grendel is descended from Cain, Mama's descended from Cain, Kinslayer. So are you going to use a Kinslayer sword, sword to kill a Kinslayer? There might be bad juju there, you know. That's how some scholars put it. Well, they haven't actually used bad juju in their writing, but you get the idea. Okay? Um, one minute left. So he gave his sword to Unferth, and we're told, 1492, he hastened boldly, 
Notice, by the way, he, he suits up this time. He's wearing the armor. He's not going to fight Grendel's mother naked without armor. He has the sword, whole nine yards. He jumps in the water, 1495. It was the space of a day before he could perceive the bottom. Your gloss. Or it was daylight. No, 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 no. That is not what it says. The Old English says, 1495, it was Thought was Dias. That was a time of the day. Every other, almost every other place where that phrase, Huildaya, H-W-I-L, time of the day, a while of the day. Almost every place in Old English literature when that is used, it means the greater part of a day. So is the greater part of a day what? Before he could perceive the bottom. He jumps in the water, so what's the greater part of it? For being literal, you don't have to. 12 hours? Okay, 10 hours, 9 hours, 8 hours, 7 hours. It takes him a long time to get to the bottom of this pool of water. One of us? No. Again, this is a marvelous, miraculous, supernatural aspect of Beowulf that critics like Mitchell and Robinson want to remove from the poem. Okay, we'll stop there. Didn't quite get a 1,000 or 1,300 lines, but we got quite a bit. Um, we'll pick up around 1,500. Uh, yeah, I'm trying to, because we're not having class, remember, a week from Thursday, because I'm having surgery that day. Um, we, we're going to finish Beowulf. If not Thursday of this week, because I'm going to skip a bunch more when we get going, um, Definitely Tuesday. I'm going to put a quiz up for about the first thousand lines. Yeah, it's about first thousand lines. Uh, I'll put it up today. Today's Tuesday. It'll be due Friday, right? <clears throat>